Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, their favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest is one of those people where I'm just intimidated because he's like the smartest person in the room. But I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash The Land Geek. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Before we talk to our guests, I just want to remind everybody, today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn how 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Have Scott Todd himself lead you up that mountain of land investing. No, no tenants, no termites, no toilets, no trash. A one-time sale. Build up your passive income without any headaches. Learn more. Just go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Today's guest is Mr. Biz himself, Ken Wentworth. If you don't know who Ken is, he is has been advising businesses for more than 20 years, uh, from Fortune 15 companies to startups, and how to establish a solid financial path. Um, he's a big deal. He's got a, a radio show, best-selling books. Um, Ken, what else you got? T tell uh -huh. us. Uh, honestly, I don't even remember all of it. Uh, it's just it's trying to reach people. Yeah, the books uh, have been good. Uh, the radio show, Mr. Biz Radio, um, online course. Uh, well, we've got all kinds of things. Um, trying to find different ways that we can help people, different um, uh, modes. Everyone learns in different ways and everyone uh, consumes information in different ways. So we try to have all those available for folks. All right, great. So, so Ken, let's just rewind the tape because mm -hmm. I imagine when you were – younger, you didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to help companies be more, you know, operationally efficient, help them with their cash flow, help them expand and just make people wealthier. So how'd that happen? You know, I think honestly, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but I'm kind of just wired that way. You know, everyone's wired. I've got a cousin who's like super artistic. And so she sees things through that lens. I have that lens from a business perspective. And I know I drive my wife that we affectionately call Mrs. Biz. I drive her nuts. I drive my daughter's nuts because I can't, I can't turn it off. I go into a business and you know, we'll be sitting in a restaurant waiting to be seated. And I'm looking and going, why do they have the servers, you know, getting the food this way? And why do they have people sitting over here? You know, I just, and my wife will look at me and she'll say, does, does your brain hurt? Cause like, like you just tell me that like makes my brain hurt. You know, uh, I can't explain it. I just, I'm just wired that way. I've always known, even from a young age, that I wanted to be involved in something in business. I just didn't know what it was. Um, so I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase for, uh, let's just call it 20 plus. We don't need to get specific dates here, okay? Uh, 20 plus years. And um, decided at one point, I mean, I had a great career there. I had a very successful and, and loved it there. But just decided that I could be making a bigger impact. And how, what would that look like? So I... I resigned from there without even knowing what my next step was going to be. I'm like, I'll figure it out. Um, it's the, that, that, that uh, cliche of an entrepreneur that you, an entrepreneur will jump off a cliff and figure out how to build an airplane on the way down. That's kind of what I did. Um, and <laughs> didn't know what this was. I didn't even know what a fractional CFO was at that time because I was so engulfed. My whole entire career was in the corporate world. So I had no idea. Uh, I was completely naive to more of the small business side of things. Um, but figured it out. And I absolutely love it. I mean, it, again, I don't, I don't work a day in my life. I absolutely love what I do. Um, and so if anything, I have to pull the reins back to like not work more because I just, it's not work to me. It's, it's like fun stuff to do. Uh, I'm a numbers nerd. What can I say? <laughs> no, it, it's fantastic. So you mentioned a fractional CFO. Could you mm -hmm. define what that means? Yeah. So fractional CFO. So think about a small business owner um, that is really good at making widgets or, or providing a service for, for uh, their clients or customers. So they're really good at making those widgets, but they might not have the business background or financial background. So, man, they're really good at creating that, that, that product, but they don't really know the business side of it. And so, and they're not large enough to need a full-time CFO, but they need someone who has that expertise. And that, so that's where I, they can hire me, make it a much more affordable aspect for them instead of hiring a full-time CFO get someone with 20 plus years experience, et cetera, et cetera. Been through those battles, wars, been, been there, done that, uh, uh, seen it and all that stuff and, and, and bought the program and um, help them 
let them focus on their business. And so I can help them with the financial aspects and some key things to look at to really make sure they're being successful. All right. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Mark, listen, I, I, uh, listen, if Kim and I went to dinner, uh, or went walking through a business, we'd probably, uh, I, I don't know, like people, we'd probably annoy the tar of everybody and probably each other because, uh, I kind of did the same thing. I sit there and I'm like, it, it, you know, like I look at all the flaws of the operation, I'm pointing them out. And my wife just goes like, why? Like, I try to go through a drive through at McDonald's and I'm like, look, if they just did this and this, yes. this way, it'd be a lot better. And she's like, Scott, every time we go through the drive through you drive me crazy. I'm like, okay, I got to stop. But uh, you know, that's the thing is like, you know, it's, it's pretty cool when you can look at a business and see like the organizational flaws in it. Okay. Like it's pretty cool because then you can take that back and be like, okay, well in my business or in, in someone else's business, I'm going to make sure that they're not doing that. Or you, you bring in all of this collection of data. And you know, one of the, the cool things I think about that is that ultimately if you can learn how to geek out on business like that, and you know, you just observe what works in other businesses, it's pretty cool because you can take what's working somewhere else and plug it into to your own business or someone else's you just plug this in there and all of a sudden it's like, wow, let's take this that, that works or doesn't work, put it into this business and bam, the business just kind of takes off from it. And I think that's one of the cool things. And look, you don't have to have any special skill sets. I don't think, I think that you just, if you just have to be curious about how things work or, and just be aware of your surroundings and all of a sudden you can build a business that's pretty dang cool. Yeah. And like the two of you are like business curmudgeons. Like Larry yeah, I mean, David like, and Curb Your Enthusiasm. You go into a business, you're like, their marketing is, is average. Right. Look at the operations. Yeah. And you're not in Orlando, are you? I'm not. No, I'm in Columbus, oh. Ohio. Okay, because I was going to tell you, like, we, you and I, we can meet up at the, um, the Macy's over in Orlando, and I'm sure we'll find some, some – we'll just geek out in there all dang day. <laughs> well, it's funny. So – and it, it, what I've found in doing this is that so often, like when I first started this and figured out the fractional CFO thing, I thought to me, it's like, well, doesn't everyone know that? Doesn't everyone think that way? I think so often, regardless of whatever your level or area of expertise is, you take for granted your own knowledge base, right? You just assume that everyone has that knowledge and they don't. Otherwise, we wouldn't have people who have these specialties and, and expertise in different areas everyone would do it. And what I find so often, especially with, with business owners of any shape, you know, real estate, it's all sorts of uh, law firms. They're so good at what they do, but they get tunnel vision, right? And so they have that. And depending on the type of business they have, they're wearing 12 different hats. And so some of the, in some cases, it's basic, in, in my mind, basic blocking and tackling a business that's getting neglected because they're running off and doing 12 other things because that's what they have to do. They have to be very tactical during the day as opposed to being strategic. And that's one of the things that I pride myself on. I tell people this all the time and it sounds silly, but I'm strategic to a fault. I was actually, I was watching Scott to see if he would laugh. And I said that because I thought maybe he'd be that way too. But, and what I mean by that is I'm always thinking, you know, five steps ahead. I'm, I'm thinking three years out, five years out. And I say to a fault because I do that. And in the same space, I trip over the curve that's right in front of me because I'm so focused out, you know, on the horizon of that decision we're making today, that sounds fantastic for today, but does that, is that congruent with, with what we want in three years and in five years and in 10 years? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of those things that I can help a lot of business owners because they don't, it's difficult to see the forest through the trees sometimes when you're, when you're buried into the weeds, uh, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a common problem. And in, in our niche, like we have our coaching program and, and really we we're trying to build this passive income machine and the machine means that you should be able to travel around the world and there's passive income just keeps coming in and as mailbox money on an automated basis. But the problem Ken, is that the cheapest person they can hire is themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very, very tough sort of mental battle to let go and systematically start getting yourself out of each aspect of the business. So my question is, at what point do you see the typical entrepreneur 
where they say, okay, now it's time to let go. The revenue supports it. And now I, I, I feel somewhat confident I can do it, but it's going to be a leap of faith. How do you walk them through that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a great question because it's very important. And I, I will say one of the things that I seek to have for every one of my clients, as well as I went through the, the process and the life cycle of my businesses, is the passive income. I mean, if you don't have passive income, you're going to be working your fingers to the bone until the day you hopefully not die, but at least till the day you retire. You could obviously expedite that retirement uh, horizon. So I've done that in my own business with passive income as well as you know, obviously the books are passive, but they're not, that's not very lucrative. You want to, I think a lot of people say, Oh, you wrote a book and it's bestseller. Like, gosh, would you, how'd you make, did you make a hundred thousand dollars off that? Like not even close. Like there's not a lot of, unless you're writing, you know, um, uh, you know, one of these classics that every Harry Potter series or something like that, you're not making a, a whole bunch of money off of books, but you know, I created an online course. So as an extension for me for passive income, and I have uh, different elements of that, that that are completely passive. People buy it, they get the videos delivered to them in a completely 100% automated fashion. Um, so I think that every business owner, you know, I, I, I look at this, a lot of business owners, when they, when they start to have success, the first thing they want to do is scale, which is understandable, but you have to scale intelligently. And, and it also, scaling takes so many different forms. It's not just I want to have four more products. It's not just, I want to open two more locations or I want to franchise or any of that stuff. It's also the scaling in my mind becomes diversification of different things in your business, including your revenue streams. I mean, honestly, I mean, I know a lot of people talk about this, but it's so, so critically important. You need to have in my mind, a minimum, absolute minimum of five different revenue streams. And it helps you. And hopefully a lot of people have seen that the unfortunate situation with the pandemic. Hopefully a lot of people have seen gosh, if I would have developed these three other revenue streams, they could have kept going and helped subsist. I could have subsisted on those while these pieces were affected by, you know, severely by the pandemic. Those different revenue streams, especially on the passive side, really, really important. So I think as you, the biggest thing is to answer your question, going back to that is you got to get your core business, your core operations, whatever your business is, an absolute well-oiled machine, tip top shape, and then as you start to think about expanding in any way, shape, or form, you need to consider those options as far as diversifying your revenue stream because that'll make things so much easier. I went through that. I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase. And one of the benefits of a huge company like that is it's not just an investment bank. It's not just a bank. So when things that happen in the economy that are inevitable that impact the investment bank and the investment bank earnings go down, it's counter cyclical on the retail side. So now our retail side is up. So they balance each other out, right? So you, you can ride the wave of the, the inevitable economic changes, right? And again, people, when I say things like that, people go, oh my gosh, you're being so negative. I'm like, no, it's, it's just a normal business cycle. You know, typically you've got a 10 year period, maybe sometimes less, things are gonna go up, things are come down, they're gonna recover. Um, and so that's one of the things we were able to do. You know, again, my, my risk management side is, I started preparing a lot of my clients, and this is getting off the topic of your question, but, um, <laughs> I was preparing a lot of my clients in May and June of 2019 for what I saw as the inevitable economic downturn that was coming. Now, of course, I didn't know there was a pandemic coming. Although in my client's eyes, I look like a genius now because we started positioning them for a downturn. And I've said I wanted to position them for July 1st of 2020, that we're going to start to see a downturn. So we need to make sure that our balance sheets are in good order, all that good stuff. And so then the pandemic hits and all my clients are like, oh my gosh, I got, you know, my my competitors are struggling, but I, we're not, we're in good shape because you've helped us. And I'm like, well, I didn't see a pandemic. So don't give me too much credit. Like <laughs> I was looking at the inevitable, you know, economic downturn, but um, so critical to be thinking out along the horizons because unfortunately, especially with this situation we're in, as you guys well know, there's a lot of businesses that aren't going to make it. I mean, it's, uh, it's terrible to say, but they're just not because they haven't positioned themselves. Everyone can get fat, dumb and happy during the good times. Right but they're not right. preparing themselves for, you know, when things go down. And so I think that's really, really important thing to also consider as you're scaling to make sure you have the proper reserves and, and cushions in place. Not only that, if you have those things, you're going to sleep better at night. You're not going to worry. You're not going to be that business owner. That's like, Hey, I have, you know, X, X amount a month in mortgage payments. I got to make, how am I going to do that? Or I have payroll that I have to make. How am I going to do that? If my business drops off by 30% or, if my tenants all of a sudden my vacancy rate goes to 75% instead of 90%, you 
can I make those mortgage payments? Having that strong balance sheet will alleviate uh, a lot of that, that stress. Scott Todd. Yeah, you know, Mark, it's funny because uh, we, you know we're sitting here talking about passive income, which you know you and I are a big believer of passive income. And I heard this complaint during the pandemic from uh, people that that um, were, were saying, "Let's get back to work." And one of the complaints that I heard people make is, you know, it's the people with the royalties, like Hollywood, the people with the royalty deals that are telling us to stay home, but we don't have royalties. We got to get back to work. And you know, like that's what you and I have been teaching for for a long time. Is it's not about the cash sale, right? Like if you if you've been in this community for a while, the Langey community, you probably remember Mark's famous like, "I don't want cash deals, I want terms deals," and the whole debate about it. And then there were people that were just outright livid that they wanted just cash deals. Well, the thing about cash is cash deals are fine until guess what? Until the cash dries up, and then 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 you need the terms deals, right? Because you don't know on any given day when the economy is going to turn. You don't know on any given day when a pandemic will come out of the blue and like swoop you out to see where's your cash deals at that point. I mean, literally, Mark, year, a couple of years ago, I'm sitting there thinking like, okay, I want to take some of my money off the table, off of the land table, and I want to put it into a different business that's uh, – um, uh, recession proof, right? So I honestly, the business I was looking at deeply is is a haircutting place because I'm thinking like, the haircutting places, they're never going to shut down, man. They're recession proof. And I even have the documentation from the company that says we are recession proof. Well, that's all fine and dandy until you find out that they're not pandemic proof, right? right? Like, uh, I mean, a buddy of mine owns, I think like 16 locations, nothing right? Like they're all shut down. They're all shut down during the pandemic. So, you know, you really have to think about like this strategy, right? It's not necessarily about scaling fast. Like Ken said, it's not necessarily about adding like all of these multiple streams. He said five, but it's not like going, okay, well, I need one, two, three, four, five today. It's about laying the foundation smartly so that you build this business and then you build one that interconnects with it somehow. Like maybe, maybe you deal with land, and you know you're dealing with your your rural land, and then you start to get that passive income really good, and then the next transition might be infill lots for you, but like you know, or maybe another state, right? Like there's nothing wrong with it. That's part of the expansion or the or the growth, I think. But you know, like the scale and go, oh man, I'm gonna mail a thousand offer letters in my first week. You you're, you're being silly, okay? Like right. you don't even know what you're doing yet. Slow down, slow down, build the systems, and then you'll be off to the races. Yeah. And, and I say a minimum of five. I mean, I, my, I myself, I have nine myself and some of those are, are small and developing. Um, but I'm thinking of the future with those and I'm slowly building those up. But I think at a, you got to have a minimum of five, um, but more the better as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier, as they say, I mean, it's so, so important. And uh, like I said, I think a lot of what I've seen, especially with the impact of the pandemic is, not only the folks that don't didn't develop those other additional revenue streams, especially on the passive side, as you mentioned, Scott, but they things have been so good in the economy in the U.S. at least for so long that people got accustomed to it. Well, it's going to happen again next year. Well, it's going to happen again next year because it's been you know I mean if you think about it, it's been ten plus years since we've really you know had that really bad uh, you know downfall. And so people got so used to, they forgot, quickly forgot how terrible it was in 08 through 10. And now it's like, well, every year is going to be this. We're going to continue growing and the stock market's going to go to 50,000. You know, it's like, oh, holy crap, guys. Well, hold on a second. If one thing history teaches you is it teaches you history. Like it's going to happen. It's going to go down, right? It's going to recover. And likely, hopefully won't be nearly as bad uh, long-term as it was 08 through 10. But um, people don't think about that because they think everything's just going to continue so peachy keen and they, they haven't prepared themselves from a risk perspective and from a, from a revenue stream and passive uh, income uh, perspective as well. I think and those that have are sitting back going, Hey, this is actually, you know, it's terrible, but it's pretty good. It's funny you mentioned that Scott, I've got a, a friend of mine who owns a, a lot of commercial real estate. And over the last three years, uh, I just talked to him about uh, three weeks ago. Now he said over the last three years, my main goal as I was buying commercial real estate was I don't want any tenants that, Amazon can take out. 
He said he wanted he not not recession proof. He wanted to Amazon proof his businesses in his uh, you know that, that were in his commercial real estate, and so he did that. And then the pandemic hits. Well, guess what? One of those was uh, actually he's got several in different places, but uh, haircutting places, right? Same thing. Yeah. He's like Amazon's not taking them out, so we're good. And so here we go. It's not like you said. It's not pandemic proof. So so Ken, what what is some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your area of expertise? The, 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 the biggest thing I see is that, and again, I think this applies across all businesses, is people think of, they get so enamored with their top line, and by top line, I mean revenue. What's coming in the door? They're so enamored by that because they want to be able to say, I'm a $5 million, $7, 10 15 $30 million company. But the big thing, and obviously that's extremely important, right? But I've also seen, and I see it way too often, uh, unfortunately, is that that growth comes at a price. And I'm not talking about the typical price. What I mean by that is if you are a $5 million company and you grow revenue wise and you grow it to 10 million, you go, oh my gosh, we hundred percent growth. This is fantastic. But if that extra 5 million comes with 5 million in expenses, you know what that means? You've just done a whole bunch of extra work for nothing. Nothing at the end of the day ended up in your pocket. And I know that sounds really obvious to state it out loud, but that happens so often. I've got clients who I'll start working with and I, I call it the silent business killer. And that's products or services that you offer that are unprofitable. And I call it silent because everyone says, every client I start working with, they go, Ken, why would I have a, a product that doesn't make money? That's just silly. And almost every business I've ever worked with has at least one. And I call it silent because they just don't realize it, right? Of course you don't think it is unprofitable, but it is. And so growing those, let's say you had a profit, a product that you, it was even just break even. And in that scenario, again, you grew and you sold $5 million extra of that new product, but it cost you five minutes break even. You've just produced and gone through a whole, whole bunch of work on, you know, for nothing. You've made no money. So you know, that scalability in all shape, forms, and fashion, it has to be at the profitability level that you want it to be. And if you can't grow it at that profitability level, then you shouldn't grow it. I mean, there are times when we've gone in and looked at different things, different revenue streams, different products, and said, we can't offer this to customers at a rate that they'll buy it. So we need to discontinue. We either need to scale back our operations or make them more efficient. And if we can't do that, we need to discontinue the product. We, for a variety of reasons, maybe it's, uh, you know, efficiencies, um, uh, economies of scale. We just can't offer it at a competitive price. So we have to stop doing it. Like there's no sense in creating that product and doing it if we're going to lose money on it. It just makes no sense whatsoever. But I'm telling you, all sorts of businesses I work with a law firm, right? You wouldn't think of a law firm like that. There was a law firm that I work with. I still work with them that have that situation or had that situation, I should say, where they had something that they were actually losing money on one of the things they were offering to their, their customer base, their client base. And again, you would just wouldn't think of it. But I think those are things you really need to peel back the onion on everything you offer in your business. Again, whether it's a physical product, it's a service, it's, it's some sort of income you have any type of income, you got to consider in your space, in the land space, think about it. And I know this is going to sound really silly to you guys, but let's say you got someone who's a landlord and they go, oh my gosh, I'm bringing in, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a month in, uh, from my tenants. And I only have, my mortgage payments are only 60,000. So I'm clearing $40,000. It's like, no guys, there's a lot more to that. What is everything else? What's the maintenance on the building? What is the reserve you're setting aside because you're gonna have to put a new roof on that building in the next number of years? What about your insurance costs? What about the landscaping? What, you know, so many people, that's another thing that lends itself to that is people think on the gross margin basis as opposed to a net margin. I don't, I honestly don't care what your gross margin is because I can make gross margin whatever I want it to be. I'll include certain things up on top that, you know, maybe should be in the bottom or vice versa. Net margin, i.e. what ends up in your pocket at the end of the day, that's it. That's the end all be all. Let's, you know, let's focus on that more so um, and make sure that, you know, that everything's profitable in that way. Yeah, no, it, it's so true. And um, I mean, even, even my own experience, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a virtual assistant business just for land investors and it was a great service, but as a business, it was terrible. And I had all these people I had to manage and, and, you know, the logistics of it, and it was not highly profitable. So we just said, hey, these people are trained and we had them create their own company. So nothing right. really changed for our client. I just didn't have to manage it 
and, and have to worry about the, the fixed overhead of it anymore. And so we just eliminate it. Now, what's interesting, Ken, is like, if, like Scott and I will go to a party and one of the, the typical questions people will ask is, and they're trying to like gauge like how big our business is. Like how many employees do you have? I think it's the dumbest question ever. Absolutely. It's like, I have zero. They're like, <laughs> right. oh, you know. <laughs> I mean, well, Mark, it could be that's, even that's in like, the form of, let's say you have several different things in your different aspects of your business. If you look at them and look at the margins on them, it sounds like just like the, the exact thing you, you did, Mark, is you might look at it and say, gosh, I've got six different businesses, six different revenue streams. And four of them, the margin, the net margins are at least 30%. Two of them, the margins are 10%. Well, geez, let me forget the 10% margin products. Let me ditch those. Again, maybe you create a partnership or in your case, you, you, you work with them and they created their own company. So again, now they can work with, so you can still offer to your customer base, but now you take your efforts you were putting into those 10% margin products and you build on your 30% margin products. Now all of a sudden your, your company's infinitely more profitable. Exactly. Scott, what were you going to say? I was going to say, like, that, that's the thing. It's like we were ta you're talking about a number of employees, right? Like, oh, Grant Cardone will tell you, like, oh, if you don't have any employees, you don't have a business. Really, Grant? Like, seriously, is that how we're judging success based on the number of employees? You know, like, I don't think that's a, that's a ridiculous thing. And I, I did like what Ken said. It's a, like, look at the margins. Like, in flight school, Mark, in flight school, I teach yield, right? Like, I teach how to break out the calculator and calculate your yield. Why? Because... If you're dealing with properties that are giving you an annual yield of 10% or 20%, well, that's fine if that's what you want. I want more. I want 70, 80% yield properties. So because the minute I take my money that's that's not produ that's producing 70 per, or I'm sorry, 20% and I put it to like 70%, all of a sudden I'm making three and a half times more money, right? Like that's the way I'm thinking. I'm not thinking about like even the total dollar. Someone's like, Oh, I sold a piece of property for, for $25,000. You know, I'm like, well, what's your yield on it? Oh, my yield's 10%. Why well, rather sell a property for $10,000 and make a hundred percent on it, get my money back faster and go. I, this is a whole module in flight school that we talk about talking about yield. And it's really amazing that to, to uh, I'm going to be like Ken here. It's amazing to me that people don't understand. Like they don't know this, right? Like they don't know. It. Like how do they not know it? Yeah, but that's the thing. That's the thing. Well, and it's the same thing. I've got I've got a guy I talk with pretty often that it, he flips houses, and you know he and I he was growing and growing and growing, and I said, well, you know, what's your minimum return you'll take on a deal? Well, he was doing what I kind of alluded to earlier is he was just growing to grow just to grow essentially, and so he was taking business uh, taking on deals as you mentioned, Scott, that were, you know, maybe they were a 10% yield deal. And it's like, well, geez, why don't you draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to do a deal that if I can't do it for, you know, for, for, for 25% plus, I don't want the deal. Right. And start to, you know, optimize your portfolio a little bit better. Cause like Scott said, I mean, that's a powerfully impactful thing that you can keep your, your, in, your influx of, of revenue, your revenue streams coming in could be flat, but your profitability goes through the roof. You make more money for the same amount of work, the same amount of uh, capital out in the marketplace. I mean, it's, it's powerful. And again, it's, again, I look back at it and I don't mean that to sound condescending. I just mean, again, it's one of those things you take for granted your knowledge base, right? I look at it and go, gosh, why wouldn't someone think of that? But you know, for a variety of reasons, they wouldn't. I could also talk to someone uh, that runs a backhoe and I try to get in and run the backhoe and they go, oh my gosh, you're going to tear the house down, get out of that thing, right? Because I don't have that skill set. <laughs> no, no, ab absolutely. So, Ken, we're at that point in the podcast now where we're going to put you on, their sp on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? So my tip, and, it's, and this is actually, it was actually a tough question for me because I, as with social media and everything, I share a Mr. Biz tip of the week. So I've got tips out the wazoo, but one of my favorite ones, and I think would definitely be a applicable to your audience is the tip is to take action. Um, progress, not perfection, right? Very important. Everyone talks, you know, talks to talk, but you got to walk the walk. And the, the way I illustrate that is, and try to make this humorous so people remember it. As, and I say, the road is riddled with a lot of flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. Are you going across the road or are you coming back? Which one are you doing? 
commit to it and make it happen and do it. But you got to take action. Everyone tries to so often make things perfect. I don't want to do it until I do this, this, and this. Start and figure it out on the way. And I'm not saying just ready, shoot, aim exactly, but it, you, not even 80, 20. You got an idea and that's something you need to get to the market. When you're at 60, hit the gas pedal and get going and you'll figure out the other 40 on the way because more than likely some of the assumptions that you've made along the way, getting to the 60, you're going to get in the marketplace and find out you were wrong and you got to make changes and you got to pivot anyway. So it's take action. You got to take action and not worry. You're going to make progress, not worry about perfection. I love and it. don't be a flat squirrel. Don't be a flat squirrel. <laughs> that could be the uh, title of the podcast. Don't be a flat squirrel. There you go. Um, Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, you know, this has nothing to do with business. It's all strictly entertainment right now. It's TV shows, right? You know, like I know you, I think we all like, you know, like always talking about, well, what, what's everybody watching? Well, the one thing that I hate is going down a path on a show and it's like, it just gets progressively worse. And you're like, why did I even commit to this thing? Right? Like everybody's hating this show in season three or four or whatever. So here's the deal, man. There's this guy, his name is Ian Ray. Okay. This guy's name's Ian Ray. And he created this website and the website is tvcharts.ianray.com. And when you go there to, to tvcharts.ianray.com, you can type in any, any show. Like I'm just going to do like better call Saul. Right. And so it pops up. And then what it does is it will show you by series and by episode, like the IMDB, uh, IMDB rating for that show. So you can see, like when I look at Better Call Saul, it's all in green, man. And green is good. It's all good. You know, it's, it's great, right? And then you can look at other shows that are just, you know, like train wrecks. And you can see that they just fall off the, they just fall off the wagon. The writing gets bad. Or they jump the shark early. Right. So, you know, this is, uh, might save you some time. Oh, this is fant fantastic. I'm looking at game of Thrones right now. 9.3. There's like three bad shows yeah. in the whole series. And th then it also showed, yeah. And they're all at the end. <laughs> 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 see it fell off the wagon and then there see like, imagine though, like it, w what, what if, what if season eight of game of Thrones where it's not so good was in, like season three and season four, you'd be like, I'm not going to watch the show. Why, why commit to it? It's terrible. Right. Oh, I love it. All That's right. Well, my tip show. of the week is going to be, first of all, don't binge watch all of Scott Todd's shows because there's <laughs> more pr productive things to do. And one of those is learn more about uh, Mr. Biz at mrbizsolutions.com. Um, learn more about being a fractional CFO, how that can help your small business. He's got tons of content, the biz radio, the live streams, the articles, the videos, um, the books. Get smarter, mrbizsolutions.com. Uh, Ken, are we good? I'm fantastic. If you guys are good, I'm good. And awesome. I will definitely use uh, Scott's tip. That, that's great. And by the way, I know, Mark, you said not to watch, binge watch all of Scott's shows. If you are going to do that, though, make sure you check out that the resource he gave you because then you can weed out the crappy ones. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right. I want to thank the listeners. Just remind you, the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like Ken Wentworth from MrBizSolutions.com is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the latest $97 wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. So please do that. And uh, Scott, are we ready to do this? We are, Mark. One, two, three. Let Not freedom, freedom ring. ring. See, Ken, we don't tell you we're going to do that. Otherwise, we, you probably wouldn't have showed up. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>